HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Southern Farm and Garden, a beautiful handcrafted agricultural journal. Subscribe today at southernfarmandgarden.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to The Great Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Rajat Parr, educator, sommelier, and winemaker. We'll talk to Raj about his wine projects, Burgundy, and other exciting wines. We'll also taste a Evening Land La Source 2014 Pinot Noir. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Great Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. With a long career in wine, Rajat Parr has been called one of the most celebrated sommeliers in the world. He has shifted his expertise and energy towards ownership and winemaking at Sandy, Domaine de la Côte, and Seven Springs, also known as Evening Lands. R- Evening Land. Raj also received a James Beard Award for his book, Secrets of the Sommelier, How to Think and Drink Like the World's Top Wine Professionals. Welcome to the show, Raj. Thank you. Great to be here. So, what I want you to do is, you have a long, deep background in wine and hospitality. I want you to tell our audience a little about how you got to where you are today, which right now is basically winemaking and having your own labels. But how did we get here? Uh, Yes, I I grew up in in India, in Calcutta, and when I was a kid, I loved food, so always in the kitchen with my mom. I spent some time with my cousins who had restaurants in New Delhi and... Since I was 10 years old, I knew that I wanted to be in the restaurant business, so, and I wanted to be a chef. So that took me to a hotel school in India, and then I ended up in the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Moved to New York, upstate New York. And did you do the whole program at yeah, CIA? Yeah, whole, two you years. Did. No focus towards wine? Uh, no, I, no, it was just okay. on, on cooking, and that was in 94, <clears throat> and then... I think in 96, uh, we had a wine uh, component to the, to the class, or to the, to the course, and I fell in love with wine. I just kept studying and reading, and when I graduated, I was like, I got to work in restaurants, and I got to learn wine. And back then, 96, there weren't that many sommeliers, especially young sommeliers. They were mostly all, you know, professionals and older guys. I, I had Kevin Zraeli on months ago, and he said when he was working back in the day, which is even before... Yeah. There were six sommeliers in New York. He said, now you go into a restaurant and there's six sommeliers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're right about that. Yeah, so I, then, I, then I just moved uh, across the country and uh, went uh, to work with Larry Stone. Did you move because the opportunity was there? Or? No, I just moved because I, I wanted to study under Larry Stone. So I okay, kind of 
So you were drawn to Larry. Yeah, and I started as a busboy, a food runner, and slowly made my way up to assistant sommelier. And after that, I worked in a few restaurants. I met Michael Mina, worked with Michael Mina. In so Larry took you under his wing. Yep. Larry realized you were passionate. Even though you were a busboy, you probably persevered a little, right? Yeah, for sure. No, I was, I was always there, always asking questions and following him around and reading. And, you know, back then there was, there was no Google. Right, and Larry, <laughs> out west, was one of the handful of guys that oh, was yeah. the guy. He was the guy on, yeah. on the west coast of San Francisco. So that's where I started. Then I worked in a few restaurants, worked with Michael Mina, uh, became his wine director. Worked with him for oh, 13 years. By the time you got to Michael, he already was up and established with a reputation and critical acclaim, right? Yeah, yeah. He had, he, you know, I started working at Aqua with him, and then right after that, I um, he, he left and started his own company, and that's how I started working with him. Right. And that was with zero restaurants, and I think when I left, there was 20-plus restaurants. Wow. Like, I don't know how many. There's a lot now. And you were, when you were there, you like you said, you elevated to wine director. You oversaw the program for yeah. the group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oversaw the program, built uh, many of the programs, uh, training, education. Uh, yeah. What was... Th- I don't want to spend too much time, but what was the skew? Did you have to serve a lot of California wines because of proximity? Did you bring in a passion of yours? <laughs> what was the seller? Because I know you're a Burgundy guy, and we're going to talk about that. Yeah, no, I uh, in my early career, there was not a whole lot of California wine. It was mostly Burgundy, Rhone, and Champagne. So that continued in the wine list for, of course, you have to have California wine because you're in California. And it's the, the, it started growing while you were moving, you know, through the oh, yeah, years it, in the business. Right. I mean, there was Burgundy around in, in, in San Francisco, but I think I, you know, when I got that, I was so excited and there was so much available back then and it was not expensive. Right. You could buy anything you want. So just kind just of... just a story now. Uh, now it's quite different. So you were instrumental in getting Burgundy out to the masses through the restaurants and all that. Yeah, there a bunch of us, yeah. But right, yeah, I'm not sure. saying single-handedly. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was, I think it was a passion. Larry had a big passion for Burgundy and, and uh, so... So that, that was my question. You developed an early affection for Burgundy. Oh, very early. I, I, went, so, straight, I went straight to Burgundy. My epiphany wine was a Burgundy, so I never really went towards Bordeaux. It was Burgundy from day one. So I was going to ask you who influenced you, and I guess Larry. Yeah. And four. why Burgundy? I mean, it was something you'd put your mind to? I mean, why wasn't it Bordeaux or, you know, you, you were attracted to the wine, the style? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of reasons. Once I, I ended up in Bone by mistake. I took a wrong train and I ended up in Where Bone. Where were you going? And I was going to Dijon, and I couldn't find a hotel room. I said, okay, next, next town, someone said, the next town has a hotel you can stay in. So I, the next town was Bones. So that was in... Bingo. That was in 96. Zero. So and I had no idea this place made wine. So I just stayed there the night, and the next day I came back to Paris. And then I kind of, you know, tasted uh, a wine with Larry. He was sitting in the bar, so he gave a light taste to somebody else, and I picked the glass up, and I'm like, wow, this is like... This is crazy. How can you know? How can wine smell like this? And but you you tell a story a lot about the first time you tried wine. You were about twenty, and you tried it with yeah. an uncle. Oh yes. And in my research, I think it was a Bordeaux. Yeah, it was. It was. It, it was, didn't hit. It, was it a good wine or? Nah, it didn't hit you the way Burgundy did a little later on. Yeah, right? that was maybe my first first real taste wine, and I think I was twenty, and you know I was in England and. My uncle was drinking wine, and you know, I I didn't really drink wine. I never had wine. I didn't like drink much alcohol, so I'm like, I'll taste it, and I taste it. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. It's made from grapes. And how can, and so it's like you're a kid. You're like, it's funny, and and you that started kind of putting stuck. everything together. Yeah, and then an like, agricultural product. Yeah, it's I mean because you know, there's not that many fruits that produce something so ethereal. Right, right, and so diverse. Um, all right, so let's talk about Burgundy. We know. <laughs> Because I want you to help me here, and I want you to help my listeners. We know Burgundy could be expensive. Yeah. We know it's rare. We know it's sought after. There's a million stories about it. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's almost impossible for the average guy to drink, but like I said, it's expensive and rare. So tell my listeners the best way to drink Burgundy on a budget. Yeah. How, mean- do, you, how do you drink Burgundy? First of all, so Burgundy is white Burgundy, Chardonnay, red Burgundy is Pinot Noir. So that's that's the basic. Okay. 
And There's of course, your grapes. Yeah, the simple as white is one grape, red is Pinot Noir, so it's, it's very simple. Uh, of course, you can get really geeky and you can get really expensive real quick, but there's still a lot of uh, a good drinkable wines like Bourgogne, Bourgogne Rouge. Bourgogne means Burgundy. In so B O U R G O G N E. Right. So that means Burgundy in French. Okay. And that's the Appalachian wine. That's like a generic wine from the from the area. And that's always quite affordable. You can buy a bottle of Bourgogne for... And do do the better producers make Bourgogne? Oh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, not all, but many of the top producers... Of, I don't want to say cheap, but it's their more inexpensive or yeah, lower-priced uh, wine. I mean, it's, it's just... It's basically in Burgundy, uh, they've classified all the vineyards. So every vineyard has a classification of either the top Grand Cru or Premier Cru or according to the village... Right. Right. Located in Borgonia is a kind of overarching major Appalachian wine. So, right. And I think that you can find some delicious uh, Borgonia for $30, $40. So you can, you're looking at $30, $40 range to get into Burgundy, to get into good stuff. Can I back you against the wall a little? Can you think of a couple of producers that are doing a good job on the Pinot? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, Muni Regiborg from Von Romane. They are a little bit more expensive than that, but top, top, uh, top Bourgogne Rouge. Uh, of course, uh, Christophe Rumier makes a pretty Rumier, delicious... Rumier, R-O-U-M-I-E-R. Uh, yeah, that's probably harder to get because he, okay. he makes so little. There's... Uh, Give me something uh, more uh, common. Jean-Marc Rouleau, maybe. Uh, Rouleau, R-O-U-L-O-T. Yeah, okay. Bourgogne. Or, you know, even if you find a Bourgogne from a, a bigger house, like a negociant like... Joseph Droin, Jadot, uh, Droin, Louis Jadot, right. Bouchard, right? Uh, you know, those those are more more available, more, more available and priced, you know, yeah. in that thirty. And, but your opinion and your opinion, you know, is highly valuable. That stuff is good too. I mean, oh, absolutely. Okay, and, and, you know, I mean, it's really good for whites. I mean, there's a, I think the really good value still lie in Chablis. You know, Chablis is the northernmost region. It's, it's uh, they make Chardonnay there mostly. So Chablis people. is the region. Chablis Chardonnay the, is the grape. Yeah. Right. And and you could get value price Chablis, which is white Burgundy. Exactly, it's white Burgundy. It's just different soil there, and it's it's a you know it's a wine of texture and uh, really delicious. It's high acid. It's very fresh. Good food and wine. Great, great with shellfish right. and, uh, you know, right. uh, you can have oysters or, you know, lobster or it depends on how heavy Seafood. you want it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good value. That you can easily get a top, top wine from, you know. So traditionally and in general with wines, Burgundy may buck that trend, but whites tend to be cheaper than a lot of the uh, red counterparts. Correct. Can you get Chablis? You know, in the twenty, thirty, forty yeah, dollar range, yeah. that's a good representation. Yeah, yeah, you, you can get you can get Chablis under thirty. Uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely uh, it's it you know it's it's even I personally drink a lot of Chablis because you know it's just a good go to it, it, wine. It's, it's a good Tuesday night wine. And same deal. There's a lot of well known winemakers wineries. Yeah, that I mean, make the, some value priced Chablis. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, again, it's a. Uh, not that many producers from uh, the Cote d'Or, from which is the which is the, uh, the the major part of Burgundy, make make Chablis. But you know, again, Droin has a great right. uh, a great uh, Chablis or Brocard. B R O C A R D. Right. Yeah, they make a good good, so good, uh, a good, one. good Chablis. So you know, there's you know, it's it's a very special place, and it makes a it makes a very unique wine. You can't you can't compare Chardonnay from Chablis. With anywhere else, it's just very, very unique. So, what you're saying is, if you take white wine, you take Chardonnay, you take it from Chablis. In your mind, that's the best representation of white Chardonnay yeah. wine. Yeah, and that's tough. Of course, if someone likes to drink a rich, uh, buttery, oaky wine, Give them then, Kendall Jackson, yeah, or whatever. So, but so I, know, I know, Ch- Chablis is not the way to go. Right. But if you like something which is crisp and fresh and and you want to uh, have a classic Chardonnay from right. from Burgundy? It's it's a really good place to uh, you know to buy wine from for sure. One last question: You alluded earlier, Burgundy has different regions and crews and all of that. On the Bourguignon and the Chablis, is it similar? Are there or it's basically? Uh, 
in yeah, so categorized. So, yeah, so you can have a Bourgogne also in Chablis, but you have Chablis, you have Premier Cru, and then Grand Cru. Okay. So We're the talking same. the lower end stuff. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the, but then there's a specific crew. Of course, when you go into single parcel wines and classified wines, then of course it gets... That's uh, less likely to be the, the lower value one. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So usually right. just an Appalachian wine, like a, just a Bourgogne Blanc or Bourgogne Rouge, so red Burgundy, white Burgundy, Appalachian wine. Those are, you know, and there are some other small regions just south of Burgundy in the... Right. In the Côte Chalonnaise, uh, and then of course in the Macon, which is the southern M-A-C- M-A-C-O-N, right? Which is producing an, uh, some good yeah, white wine. It's a southern part, a southern part of Burgundy. Uh, it's just uh, it's just north of Beaujolais, which is uh, also now Beaujolais um, is part of Burgundy, correct? But we don't talk about Beaujolais really as a Burgundy. Uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, you can actually call a if you call it Bourgogne Rouge, you can use a Gamay in there also. Okay. And so, I know you make one Gamay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a well, Gamay is, is, I mean, I think well, maybe the most delicious grape in the whole world. We'll, we'll talk later so. when we get to your wines. Um, so there's Burgundy and then there are regions that surround it like Macon and Beaujolais that are producing some good wines too that are accessible. Yeah. All right. So enough of Burgundy. My head's spinning. Um, <coughs> but... Let's stay with Burgundy for a second, because one of the reasons you're in town, because Raj is a West Coast-based guy, is there is an event going on that is sort of the Mac Daddy of <laughs> Burgundy events. It's an event called La Paule, and it was founded by Daniel Jonas, who has been on the show and a friend of Raj, and I think you could do a better job explaining at this point, you know, what La Paule is and the connection to Burgundy. Yeah, so La Paule is is uh, is, a, is a harvest end of harvest celebration. It started in the t- village of Merso, and every year after harvest in November, uh, all the Burgundy, all the Merso producers get together and have a big party. I mean, this is like seven eight hundred people. In one old, uh, you know, it's a, it's a chateau in Merceau, and only Merceau producers can participate. Of course, they can invite other producers, right. all the other Burgundy but producers. The core is them, yeah. but it's 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 hosted in Merceau by the Merceau producers, and so Daniel Jonas took the same spirit of the La Pole de Merceau and made uh, an event which is called La Pole de New York, and then La Pole de San Francisco. So every other year happens, and and then he invites a lot of producers, the top producers, and then has a week-long, uh, I mean, it's just like tastings and lunches and dinners and seminars, and then you finish on a Saturday night with this great big party, and everyone brings bottles. And Where is that this uh, year? Oof. Is it's, it, it's, a, it's a new location this year. Oh, yeah, it is. Well, I, we'll get to it later. Uh, yeah, but, it's, but it's at all restaurants. They use There's Burgundy Week that participate. Oh, yeah. all, yeah. There's tastings with famous winemakers that come in from France. Oh, yeah. Tastings and seminars. And then there's Burgundy Week. So all the top restaurants in, right. in, in New York City have, uh, you know, pour different Burgundies by the glass. It's really a huge celebration of Burgundy. But I, I have a question a little off topic, but we'll get back to it. So you're pretty much in town to participate in a lot of that. Yeah. And I follow you on Instagram, but last night you were like at the most amazing Cornas case. <laughs> How does that fit into La Pauli? No, we, we just had a, you know, a bunch of us were in the Rhone uh, last week. Right, and, I saw and, that trip. Yeah, yeah so, so we were in the Rhone, and we all love Syrah, of course. And we had organized this, like, a, kind of a, just a tasting among dinner for friends uh, right. late, at, late at night. So it wasn't... It wasn't part of any Burgundy festival, but, but it was just a. It just happened because we all are in town at the same time. Right. Just to it was a perfect time to open do that. some bottles. Yeah, you just got back from that trip to France. Yeah, and you were in more than the Rhone region, right? Yeah, I'm writing a book. I was uh, going to say you were there so, for a reason. Tell yeah, me, yeah, yeah. tell me a little about the book. When, what? Yes, yeah, so me and Jordan McKay, my good friend and co-author, we who you uh, wrote the other book the, with, the last secret song right. book with. Uh, we are writing a book called The Atlas of Taste. And in the book, we're trying to, in one book, trying to, trying to discuss uh, how, how cl- all the classic wines of the world, why they taste the way they taste. So we've, we've been all over uh, Europe. So you uh, go backwards. Yeah, so to exactly. To the sites from, from, and the yeah, winemakers, exactly. the wineries. It comes, starts in the vineyard, and then we taste the wine, 
and then we try to kind of figure out and explain to our readers why it why does you know Shambul Muzni taste like that? Why does Shino taste like it is? Why does Rioja taste like what it is? What the grape is, what the soil is, and uh, you know try to kind of so uh, the most obvious out. things are the soil is so diverse, the grape. Yeah, type. Yeah, it's soil. But when you get to Burgundy, everybody's doing Pinot. But the diversity of sites—that's where it gets interesting. Exactly. Right? We're not going to get I mean, crazy geeky because you could go really deep on this. But right. something which people can open one book and say, okay, you know, I want to see, you know, what's the grape or what's the soil or what's in, you know, Ribera del Duero or what's the soil in in the Mosul Zaruber or what is in, you know. Now, so how the, many regions are you going to cover? A lot. All, You're not just all, going France. No, no. It's France, how, Italy, uh, Spain, Germany, Austria. Wow. How deep into it are you? Uh, we've done all the research. Almost you, three years of research. You've been to Austria. And you've yeah, been to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. seeing you in uh, Germany. Yeah, yeah. So not that long ago. Also, also all that. So right. now we are just in the process of putting it together, writing it. and. So when do you hope? To get it done uh, and get it to it market, should be, it, should, it needs to be done by October and of this year. Yeah, oh, and, you're going to be busy. Yeah, and then uh, and then we are going to you know be published next fall. Great, I'd love to talk to you again when the book comes out. For sure, that would be great. So the book is again called the Atlas of Taste. The Atlas of Taste. Do you know Pascaline Le Peltier? Very she's well. writing a book called Dirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she's working on that too. All right, I want to shift over to what you do and Raj earlier said you know he had worked in hospitality and in wine now he's currently involved in uh, three wine projects at pretty much every level so you are making Pinot Noirs in California yeah you've really picked sites and everything and when we get to the individual wineries we'll talk about that tell me I'm more curious but I'm sure everyone what's the biggest difference between California Pinot Noir and French Burgundy Pinot Noir. Oof. Is there such huge is it difference? The terroir yeah. and the grape. I yeah, mean, the, do you aspire to do that? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, just California itself is so diverse. From starting from you know Anderson Valley and going down to San Rita Hills. You're talking of you know Sonoma Coast, Santa Cruz Mountains, by the ocean. Inland, yeah. So, so the one common factor in all of California is it's all maritime climate. So it's all influenced by the ocean. As we know, Pacific Ocean is quite cold, so it keeps uh, keeps us keeps the wind, keeps the fog, so we can grow grapes. Uh, in Burgundy, it's continental climate, so it's influenced by the latitude. Uh, so there are two major differences right there. Uh, the growing seasons are completely opposite because it's. Right. Warm in the summer in 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 Burgundy, and in it's cool in the summer in on the coast of, of California. So it's very different. The soils are very different. There's not any soil in California which is which is like Burgundy because so what's uh, limestone. What's the big all that added up creates two different types of what's the biggest distinction is. California brighter is. Uh, it? Of course, we have a lot more sun. Okay. And uh, I don't have, mean brighter in the sky. No, I mean but the wine itself is it? Oh, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit uh, what, softer it? and rounder and uh, I won't say riper for alcohol or sweetness, but it just it just seems much more uh, you know it's f- forward drinking, much easier drinking. It doesn't have the same tannin structure. Doesn't have the same you know the guts is different. It's just, it's not as right. You know, it's it's a softer wine. We don't have the same phenolic, you know. Kind Even of, if you brought French vines grafted, no, it, it, nothing would happen because no, of no, the climate, climate and, and soil. Yeah, right. it's it's completely so that no. that style is going to come about. You manage it, yeah, which is a good segue into my next question because you have a very distinct style of wine and. That came out when you and Jasmine Hirsch, who had been on the show, started an organization. Would you call it an organization? Yeah, it was a it was a small group, which it's, I it guess was called in pursuit became. of balance IPOB. Yeah, yeah. And the mission statement yeah. was that wines were being made a certain way, which is fine. But you guys saw wine as being made how we're drinking how. Yeah, there, there were a handful of producers who were uh, making wine in uh, more of a, I guess, old world uh, style wine with 
you know, uh, more, more earthy wines, more wines driven by acidity and freshness. And then the majority of California, which still does produce wine, slightly riper, slightly more, slightly softer, slightly lower acidity, more fruit driven. And there were a handful of us who were thinking more about structure and acidity and kind of earthiness in wine. And we created this small organization among friends just to, uh, you know, just to kind of uh, have a voice of saying, hey, there's another uh, uh, style in, in California. It's not all just, uh, you know, ripe and juicy and, and, and uh, you know, soft. There's another, another style. And that was just a bunch of us got together and kind of just and, and made a bunch of noise. We were all kindred <laughs> souls. And you yes. all have the same vision. Boy, did that get attention. Let's talk about that a little. Because yeah, now everybody yeah. thought, wow, your shit doesn't smell. You know, what's yeah, wrong yeah, with yeah. what we're doing? I mean, you had, a, you had to deal with that a little, right? And yeah, it, it yeah. grew yeah. bigger for years, more members. Yeah, yeah. You know, of course, you know, if you ever, you know, draw a line in the sand, it's always going to be like, what are you doing? It's like, you know, it's like, and it wasn't, it was not an argument of fight. It's just about, this is another way. Well, you didn't pick the fight. You just pursued the passion. It's the other side that kind of picked and said, who do you think you are? Is that fair? uh, Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we didn't want to ever, uh, you know, argue with somebody else's livelihood and business plan because that's not what we, we were just trying to say, this is, us and we are doing this. Not That's just all, that, right? That it wasn't was, like let's do something to screw those guys. No, was, no let's no. get together and show no, 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 other no. styles. Many of my friends, uh, you know, uh, who we've discussed this with, it was it was never intended to, uh, you know, ever tell somebody else that they right. did the wrong thing. It was just bring attention to a, a few of us who were trying to, uh, you know, because because of course the the press. And the media was not all on our side, very few. Right. So, uh, you know, and if you're only buying wine by looking at scores, by scores from, from uh, wine publications, it becomes difficult because, of course, all our scores are quite low compared to the riper style. So it wasn't meant to kind of, there was no fight intended. It just kind right. of was another style because we didn't have the support of the press. Now, is that because the press supported the mainstream wine business? Like if you pick a specific thing, Wine Spectator, you know, they're, they're doing business with all the, you know, Uber wineries and all that. That's not that much in their sight. You, uh, I mean, I, you know, first of all, I have nothing against any publication. Right. Person. And I'm not trying and, to say, and, and, yeah, and but I, I, I'm going to retract that. I think the mainstream media looks at the business a certain way. And you were coming up with a good idea, but you did have some voices like John Bonet. Yeah, no, no, you no, know, no. He was right. Yeah, John Bonet and Eric Asma. Yeah. No, that's plenty. You know, it, it was, it was not meant to be what it became. Right. That's, that's the reason we, <laughs> we, so we ended it because you had a run for about what four or five years. Yeah, six years. And yeah. you did tastings around the country. Yeah, we did tastings, and at the end, you had about how many producers? Uh, like twenty something, twenty five right. or thirty, close to thirty actually. And it just made sense. You you made your yeah not made your point. You, yeah, you did what you intended. Yeah, to it, do. it was meant to be a small tasting among friends, and I think maybe it became bigger than what it should be. And right, and not sorry you did it. Oh no no yeah. it, it, I it, mean, was, it was a great it, 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 thing. Was, it was great doing it. It just took a lot of time and energy. And yeah, <laughs> as if you're not busy enough. Right. You know, so. Anyway, all right. I want to segue a little towards uh, the wines and winemaking and all of that. But in doing that, you were a sommelier, and you clarified a few things for me. You're devoting all your time to the wineries now? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. No longer, you know, consulting or beverage directing? No, for, no, no, no. Okay, no, and no, I know no. it's a full-time job. So tell me, biggest difference between being a sommelier <laughs> and now... Not running, you know, one winery and making wines yeah. to, to doing what you're doing now. And oh, it's not as if you weren't busy as a psalm. Oh, yeah. It's a humbling experience because, you know, you, you put yourself out there. You, you know, you plant a vineyard uh, and you make wine and you don't know how it's going to turn out because if you make it in a natural way without any manipulation, so you kind of leave yourself out there to be, you know, judged by whoever. So, you know, it's so that's what you do. We kind of produce a wine from the place and and produce a wine which is in our style and my and Sashi style 
Uh, we, Can you describe that? Yeah, you know. I mean, you have to. I wouldn't more call like, it house style, but you have a vision of what your style. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I've been in restaurant business for two decades, so of course, uh, my early wines were all European wines. So, of course, all our and Sashi Mormon, my partner, he also has been drinking most European wines for uh, the last twenty years. So, of course, our style is more uh, like that, more kind of crunchy fruit and fresh and acidity and. And texture and, and earthiness, uh, you know, less less so. Uh, you know, we don't want the wine to be too fruity, and it's not going to be like you know to control uh, the acidity. Yeah, the alcohol. Jammies. Right. Yeah, so the wines are you know, uh, it's, they try to make it more uh, kind of fresh and balanced in whatever the word balance means. So that's the style. Go back to the question. You were a sommelier, now you're a winemaker. Yeah, just. You get up now and it's just a totally different. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah. What what what, what do you, what don't you miss? What do you miss? I well, mean, you, you can control a lot when you're a sommelier because you can you, you can judge a lot of things. And here you have your own wine. You judge your own so barrels. You judge your own what you do, and you're never happy with it. And and you were a hospitality guy. You like being around <laughs> people and turning them on to wines and all that. Yeah. Now it's, you're in some dark cellar or something. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm out still enjoying the wines, and you know, because me and Sashi, we of course we make the wines. We also go and show the wines. We don't really have uh, any sales teams or you know, marketing team. We do it ourselves. I, I'm on your mailing list. I get regular uh, info. We'll tell people where to find stuff. But you do a lot of the sales through mailing yeah. lists and all that. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we we have a, a mailing list, and of course, uh, being in restaurant, I want the wines to be in restaurants. Well, and, you know the business. Yeah, yeah. In every end, so that's a good positive point for the winery that oh yeah and, you know and, getting into restaurants for sure. even though you have to do it for sure and, and you and, have to pre-sell yeah and our vision is these of course these wines these vineyards some we've, we've bought and some we've planted is going to outlive us for sure it's not in none of our none of our wines have our names on it it's just right. uh, so let, let's talk about that because there's a lot to talk about so and correct me if i need correction you are operating, you're the proprietor of um, three wineries, Sandy, which you started in around 2010? Yeah, so nine was the first vintage and 2010, yes. Okay, so you're the partner proprietor there. It's a small producer focusing on select vineyards. So tell me, you, you know, yeah, so, the distinctions of Sandy. Yeah, so Sandy means uh, collaboration in Sanskrit, so I, of course, grew up in India, so right. that's the, hence the name. And collaboration because it's a it's a negotiation. It's it's we buy all our grapes, so we don't own any vineyards under Sandy. We started that in 09, uh, first vintage, and we produce mostly Chardonnay. And uh, give me a percentage. Is it like 70 percent uh, Chardonnay? Yeah, it's seventy percent okay, Chardonnay. So that's from, your Chard. Yeah. House. Yeah, and it's it's uh, focusing uh, the base. The, the one the major main main one I make is the Sandy Santa Barbara County Chardonnay. And then we have also, uh, we are of course based in Lompoc in Santa Rita Hills. So we have a bunch of single vineyard Chardonnays from Santa Rita Hills only. You contract almost seven, eight, nine wine or, uh, vineyards, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, you know, we, we make wine from the heralded uh, Sanford Benedict vineyard, the Mont Carmel vineyard, uh, and uh, Bent Rock, and uh, Rita's Crown. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really amazing place to grow Chardonnay and, and to... The styles make, vary that much because of the... Different vineyards. Yeah, we try to make the wine the same way, and you know, natural acidity, ambient yeast, all that kind of good stuff, right. and uh, and then show what the vineyard has to express. And uh, uh, the wines are definitely more crunchy, uh, probably among the highest acidity Chardonnays in in the New World in California for sure. So you know, that's that's the idea because it's you can you can make that kind of st- style of wine there very easily. Right. Um, and you said you make a few Pinots. And we make a Appalachian wine and a, just a little bit of some old vineyards, right. some Pinots. So yeah. if you want to drink good Chardonnays, Sande is a, certainly a specialist. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you like the fresh and crunchy right. style Which Chardonnay, we've been talking about for yeah, the, you yeah, know, that, that's the definitely show. I you know I know if, you know I, I like to describe the style so it's, you know it's not it's not rich and oaky and uh, right. sweet so right. So we move to Domaine de la Cote. Which is based in Lampoc. Yeah, it's also in Lampoc. So both the wines are made in the same place. Right. Uh, the vineyards are just five minutes away from where, where the winery is in the wine ghetto. 
in Lapok. That's what it's called. That's what it's called. Uh, the wine ghetto. So, and these are vineyards which uh, which Sashi Mormon found, my partner. Do you and, own them? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we planted the vineyards uh, starting in 07, and we are still planting now. So it's all estate. Uh, it's mostly all Pinot Noir. What makes an estate? The winery has to be on or near the vineyards, or not necessarily. No, it's all owned. It's a, it's a, you, so you we have con- to own the yeah. So okay. so so we control all the farming. Uh, everything happens according to us. There's no, uh, you know, it's 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 managed entirely by the, an, right. an estate or a domain. Is say, totally it's totally controlled. Totally controlled from farming to bottling. So you have. Multiple vineyards, forty plus acres, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we have uh, our four major vineyards: uh, Memorias, Bloomsfield, Lacote, and Cyrus Call. And those are the names of the wines. Those are the names of the vineyards, the and, vineyards the wines, yeah. and the wines. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else about those wines? They're organically grown. Right? Yeah, they're organically grown. They're the virgin soils. There was nothing really planted there before that. Uh, we make them in a very traditional way. They all are fermented with mostly the whole cluster, whole bunches. So we don't destem. Uh, Explain to my listeners what that means. So, you, so the whole cluster is the grape, the stem. Yeah. So it's it's like when you There's pick maybe a leaf in there too. Or well, no, okay. we don't like leaves. But right. when you when you pick the cluster, when you, everyone's eating the grapes. When if you take the whole whole cluster, the entire cluster, you ferment it in its entire... the stem attachment. Everything, yeah. So, so, you, so, you, so you don't take the... You, you don't take the berries right. off. You, you what does the stem add? Tannin? Or uh, what, what's the characteristic the, the, by doing a whole cluster? It's not necessarily about the stem that should add the character. It's the fermentation happening inside each berry. Okay. That is what, what is more important. But I'm... I'm I'm stumped here because if you pulled the berries without the whole cluster, you did the whole cluster. What effect is whole cluster, or what? Because why? when you when you take the berry out of the stem, right, the juice comes out. Oh, of, okay. Out, out of the berries, it's intact so, in a way. It, yeah, so it's intact. So fermentation is happening inside every every berry. So you have a lot of uh, different texture of wines. Got it's you. not. It's just, it's just texture is different from whole cluster Got versus you. D-stem. And, and they both, there's no right or wrong answer. So we do right. mostly with whole bunches, whole cluster, and we ferment them in in uh, large concrete vats, concrete tanks, open top, and with ambient yeast and no additives. and No oak in sight. Yeah, we don't, we don't put any yeast. We don't put any enzyme, no nutrients. It just ferments. And, and then... When this is done, you press it, you put it in the barrel. So tell me the four wines. Tell me what each one is. So Give me the names again yeah. and tell me the type yeah, of so wine. Yeah, so they're all, all single parcels. Memorias, right. uh, which is uh, which is the most exposed to the ocean. It's eight miles from the ocean. It's the windiest place where we grow grapes. Uh, and the soil is this kind of alluvial kind of soils. And the, and the, the bedrock is diatomaceous, which is a silica-based fossil. Uh, and then right above that is Bloomsfield, which is more iron-rich clay. So wine is slightly more muscular, slightly right. more spicy. And then we have uh, Lacote, which is all shale, which is metamorphic clay. Pretty diverse. And that's uh, south-facing, and that uh, produces a very aromatic and kind of ethereal, very rose petal and, and nice. red fruits. And then above that is Siren's Call, which is two and a half acre. It's a very... Uh, Small vineyard, uh, decomposed quartz, <laughs> and and that produces uh, a uniquely different wine. It's, it's usually more tannic and uh, quite explosive. So you said you planted in 07? 07, yeah. So uh, stuff is still growing and not ready to... Are, are you... Is all the acreage planted, and is everything ready to pick, or um, it's an ongoing process? It's a, it's almost all picked, almost all planted. So a little bit left. By I think by next year we'll have uh, sixty five acres all planted. Uh, right now only forty are producing. Okay. Uh, so and so it's uh, forty acres planted producing. You have more acreage, which have more... been, pl- been planted. Right. And, so that's good uh, news. Yeah, so you know we might have even some more single parcels down the road because even though the plan in 07, the first vintage was 2011. Great. All right, let's move to uh, your third project, um, Evening Land 
Seven Springs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Was... And if you go backwards, back to Domaine de la Cote, they, the domain, some of the Domaine de la Cote parcels were part of the Evening Land vineyards? Is yeah, initially they were planted under the Evening Land umbrella. And then we took it over and separated that because it's just complicated to have the same name in different places. Right. So, uh, the, and then uh, Evening Land was the, was the, is the mother company for Domaine de la Cote. Uh, and that's Oregon? Evening Land is Oregon, yeah. So now right. it's only Oregon because in the past, right. there was That's, there was Sonoma, there was Santa Rita. Now it's 100% Oregon, it's 100% uh, Seven Springs, which right. is a very, very in, famous video. How do you pronounce it? The Eola Amity Hills? Yeah, the Appalachian. Right. Uh, it's called Eola Amity Hills right. in the Willamette Valley. And you're making predominantly Pinot there? or uh, P- Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. And a little Gamay. And a little bit of Gamay. Right. Yeah. So... How many wines are you making? Uh, we have, uh, right now we have seven wines from, from the estate. Uh, and, and your first outlier, a Gamay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, Tell the, me why and how that came about. So the Gamay has been there uh, since, uh, I guess, since 1988. That was the first veneer of Gamay, I think, planted maybe in Oregon. And it's, it's been there. It's own rooted, so it's, you know, it's just on volcanic soil. It's just, it's been there. So we make it. In a very traditional, uh, you know, Beaujolais style, carbonic maceration, all with whole cluster, and and it's a uh, very drinkable. And I haven't just... tried it. I'm I'm excited to try it. Yeah. Um, and I have my notes. You dry farm. You're yep. a live certified. Live yep. is a specific certification. Yeah, 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 yeah. And are you biodynamic? Biodynamic? Yes, are you shifted? yes. Yeah, yeah. Since oh eight, so. Do you plant uh, that ram's horn in the soil somewhere? Oh yeah, yeah. You go, oh, yeah. Crazy, yeah, it's, you know? it's, it, yeah. You have to yeah. follow the Steiner thing. Yeah, right? yeah. We did that in in October, and then it's gonna you know when there's uh, start a bud break, we're gonna take it out, the horns empty, and just spray it in the vineyard. So it's you're a, a good person to ask this because since I've been doing the show, the natural organic biodynamic wine movement is well on its way. We do the show out of Brooklyn, and there's a lot of bars dedicated to you know just raw wines and wine stores the first raw wine fair was in brooklyn last yeah. fall and all of that um how does how does live certified biodynamic organic farming how does it affect the taste of the grape uh you know it's, it's does it it's a hundred percent it's good the, it's it's yeah i mean you know of course, you have to make the wine in the correct way. Also, right. you can't expect the wine to just. We're talking farming, but first. but farming, you create this amazing microflora and all this amazing organic matter in the soil. Sustainability, which really gives the grapes a different kind of energy and different kind of vibrancy. Of course, if you make the wine in the correct way in the cellar without any manipulation and. And, and, and you make it that well right away. The energy is unbelievable. You can taste it. You can you feel really it. really can. Oh, 100%. It's, 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 there's, there's, I don't want to get too, too geeky, but you can, it's, it's proven scientifically. It's, uh, you can taste it. You can, you can see it. You can see, you walk in the vineyard, you see all the worms in the vineyard. It's you know, alive. You see, it's alive. I mean, you know. Would you, it almost sounds like it would be hard not to make wines that way now, if you could. Yeah, I, you know, uh, you know, you've had Pascaline here, and and, yeah. and and you know, she's dedicated her entire uh, life, and of course, her wine program to that sort of wine, and it's uh, it's important. I think it's the only yeah. way for the future because we have to sustain uh, not only our bodies but our vineyards, the land, what we sure. eat, what you know, the bread, the vegetables, the meat, all these hormones, and it's great so. to have you know advocates like you that practice that. And Pascaline and all. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. My guest is Raj Parr, um, winemaker, former sommelier, all around busy guy. Um, you're listening to The Great Nation. We'll be back after these uh, messages. This episode is brought to you by Southern Farm and Garden, a beautiful handcrafted agricultural journal. Each issue features stories about food history, seasonal recipes, artisanal products, and the amazing people who bring it to your table. Packed with stunning photography, the content is fresh and educational. 
Southern Farm and Garden takes you behind the scenes to meet farmers, gardeners, wineries, chefs, and artists who are passionate about creating healthy, unique, and sustainable food and products that you can enjoy all year. Are you interested in eating healthier and learning more about where your food comes from and living a more connected life? Subscribe today to southernfarmandgarden.com. Foodtank.com named Southern Farm and Garden one of the top 20 magazines for people who eat, cook, and grow, praising it for connecting readers with the food, the farms, and the stories behind our food system. Subscribe today or find a retailer near you at southernfarmandgarden.com. All right, we're back with Raj Parr. I want to, we could go on a long time with Raj because he knows a lot about everything, but I want to subject him to my wine list because I'm curious what he's drinking and thinking. So Raj, every week we ask our listener, our uh, guests uh, pretty much the same questions and I want to get your take on all of this. So what are you drinking now? And I, I like, I know you had 18 bottles of Cornas and, you know, we're at Burgundy La Poly, but what's like... What are you trying or what have you been sort of leaning towards at home or curious about? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, here we are. So I guess it's snowing right now. And, Terrible. And uh, it's cold. So, uh, you know, uh, of course, different wines for different occasions. But what I usually, I drink at home, I drink a lot of Beaujolais. You like so, Beaujolais? Uh, good, good everyday wine, good, good food everyday, wine. Good everyday, yeah, great. Crunchy, Give me fresh. one or two good producers. Uh, my favorite producer is uh, Jean-Louis Dutrev. D-U-T-R-A-V? A-I-V-E. A-I-V-E. Yeah, Dutrev. this amazing human being, amazing guy in, okay. in Fleury. Uh, you know, and of course there's Lapierre, uh, there's Foyard. Uh, Foyard Bourge- is spelled how? F- F-O-I-L-L-A-R-D. D, right. Uh, Those are good Beaujolais. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's a, Gamay is a delicious grape, and all these producers make it in a very... Pure and natural way without uh, any additives. and So uh, Beaujolais is what you're drinking now. And yeah. It's also a good all-around yeah. wine to have. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, it's affordable, though it's getting expensive slowly, but right. it's, it's still affordable. Uh, I guess know. if it was 90 degrees out and sunny, maybe we would have said a Chablis or something, but that uh, makes sense for now. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean you know, I mean, I, I think for, in, in white grapes, I, you know, I, I drink... Uh, Dry Riesling and of course Loire Valley, so Chenin Blanc. Right. Uh, uh, for some reason, I've been drinking less Chardonnay in the last. Uh, it's okay. In, in the last uh, few few it's months. All right. All right. Give me your favorite wine and food pairing. Kind of a general question, but you got to look <laughs> back and go back, and more times than a few. You just love the fact that you have a bottle of this and you're eating that. What's a good food pairing for you? I'm not saying recommend. Yeah, no. What do you like? You know, uh, if people don't know me, I have my 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 classic meal at every at home anywhere will be a, a green salad, okay, and roast chicken, okay. You know, and, Zuni does a pretty oh, good job. Yeah. But what goes? So what are you drinking world. with that? You know, uh, I love like Saint Joseph. I love Syrah. From the Northern Rhone, something which is crunchy and fresh and full of energy, you know, it's... it's Pierre it's, Gonon, oh, yeah. give me a couple Go- other... Yeah, you, yeah. You met him, right? I mean, yeah, Go- the Gonon, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a friend, he's amazing, amazing, amazing producer. What's another... Uh, you can also have, uh, you know, uh, Jean-Louis Chave makes a, Chave. Makes a uh, kind of a basic saint Joseph offer us, which is very affordable, uh, and then he also makes an estate, a domain... Jean Louis Chave. Uh, so the Chave is a good if you want to go on an inexpensive end. He makes a more yeah. of an entry. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. All right. So chick grill, roasted chicken salad, and a little <laughs> roan. That's a good. Yeah, it's that's a good white and food pairing. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, right. I, at home I have a grill, so I I, I cook I the chicken on the grill. Yeah, it's a little Traeger grill. It's a little it's, more work. Yeah. Um, at least you didn't say champagne or muscadet and oysters. I love you for that, um, <laughs> even though that's good. All right, this is, we usually ask people this from where they're from, but you've been in out of New York enough, and you know San Francisco as well as anyone. Give me your favorite wine restaurant and or bar. A restaurant that is great but has a good attention towards 
uh, oh. wine too. Oh, I think uh, I like think, Pascaline and Patrick do yeah. it well. You, yeah. you know, maybe that's your. But, but yeah, for sure. Give me one for New York and give me one for San Francisco. I, I think I think Ravel is 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 uh, you know a great example because the food is delicious. One one Michelin uh, star chef. You can you can eat there every day, and the wine list is incredible. It's it's deep, and it's you can you can buy a delicious fifty dollar bottle of wine, or you can buy crazy a thousand two hundred dollar bottle right. of wine. It's 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 all there and. Most of it is affordable. The markups are great, and and Chef Daniel's food is terrific. You know, I, I could eat there a lot. So, what about San Fran? In San Francisco, uh, my favorite restaurant in the whole world is Zuni Cafe. Okay, and and they have a terrific wine list. They do. Oh yeah, it's 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 really is well. Is it as good as the food? Oh yeah, for sure. Because okay, I mean, you know, there's a famous steakhouse, Peter Luger's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. have the worst crap wine list no, no, and the no, most famous no. steak. No, the, 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 the wine list is, is it's great. incredible. It's not a big wine list. It's small, well curated. curated. Yeah, you can drink, you know, Italian. You have you can drink the German. You can drink, the, you know, it's and Burgundy. It's, it's really well priced, and it's all there to have with your roast chicken. So those, <laughs> those are two good choices. Yeah. Now, I ask this question to everyone, but I don't always ask it to Raj Parr, so I'm curious about Raj Parr. Favorite all-time wine? What's the wine that moved you? And there's you can give me a couple if wow. you have. But there's got to be... I mean, we could even classify it as the wine you drank with your uncle, the Burgundy, <laughs> you know, with Larry, because those were life-changing. But yeah. there's got to be something that you, you I mean, think about, or a few. I mean, it's, yeah, there, there's, there's many, but, you know, I mean, personally... It depends on where I am. I mean, my epiphany wine was uh, Raveneau Chablis Le Clos 86. That's, when did you drink that? Uh, Pretty close, a few years after that? Or? Yeah, I, I had it for the first time in, in 96. Okay. And, and uh, uh, my friend Robert Bohr opened a bottle for me a couple of years ago. So it's always... It's a terrific. It's always special to revisit a wine which you started with. Right. Uh, 20 years ago. So that's so, the Ravenel. Yeah. What was the, Chablis Le Clos. So Le Clos. Okay. 1986. It's, it's, you know, it's, you don't see the wine too no, often. No, no, no. It's, but that, I'm not <laughs> asking for accessible, available wines or whatever. Yeah, but, but um, you know, and, you know, so that's, that's something which is, you know, it's always, I, it's in my mind all times. All right. That's a good one. Last question, and I, this helps my listeners, and you're going to have to jar your mind juggle a little best wine under 15 bucks retail that you know give me a red give me a white can you think if you you're sending my son to the store he's having a dinner party he wants three bottles of wine he's got 15 couple bucks more what's he drinking on the red side what's he drinking on the white side so uh i think i think for uh red i think that uh, again coming back to gamay i think uh I think I'm not sure how much it costs. Maybe a little bit more than fifteen. It's the, the Raison Gaulois. It's the Gamay from La Pierre. It's like the second. La Pierre is the La, maker. Yeah. L A P P I E R. So L A P P I E R E. Right. And and so they make a kind of a second label called Raison Gaulois. Which Spell is, the Gaulois for me. It's G O U L O I S. I think. E. S E. Gaulois. Yes. And yeah, so it's a, it's their kind of basic gamay. I think it's around that price between fifteen and twenty, and, probably. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, so that that's a great one. How about a white? You know, uh, just you know, of course, you have to go to the Loire. I think I think Muscadet. You come back. Muscadet to, comes up more. It's a great wine for the money. Yeah, it's you know, there's there's a lot of producers who make, you know, delicious. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a fresh wine. It's. Of course, right now I can't think of it because it's snowing outside. But I know, but like Marc Olivier, Pepier, Pepier, Pepier is probably uh, those are you good. Know, I, I think and those you, are value wines. Yeah, I think they are. I think under so 20. Muscadet over and over is really the the white value wine. All right, good job on that. Um, <laughs> we we post that on our site, so uh, I'll tell you later. All right, we're gonna we're talking to Raj Parr. We're going to wrap up the show in a little bit, but we're going to go into our weekly wine sip. Every week we taste a different wine on air. Um, for our sip this week, I twisted Raj's arm and made him bring a wine in. 
<laughs> not because I wanted a free wine, but I really wanted a taste with Raj, and I wanted to feature one of his wines. So Raj, tell me, because you brought it in, I don't have the notes, tell me what we're drinking. Yeah, so we have uh, our Evening Land uh, Seven Springs La Source Pinot Noir 2014. So this is an estate, a uh, very famous estate, uh, which has been around since uh, since the mid-80s. And um, we acquired it in 2014. So we made this wine. This is our first wine from pruning to bottling. Uh, and it's filling La, the room up. Yeah, La Source is a, is a single, uh, single section of the estate. Uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, a wine which is... Uh, you know, very classic of Oregon has that kind of cranberry smoky note. Uh, you know, it has a little bit of the leathery kind of. You know, we use a whole cluster here, so uh, and, and you know, it really kind of shows the volcanic soil it's grown on, and uh, it's in our style. It's you should taste it. See, All right, so see. that's the setup and the description. So let's look at the color. Describe the color to me. Yeah, it's you know, it's like a, a pale ruby red color color. Um, you know, it has probably like, you know, medium viscosity. It's, right. you know, if you smell it. Let's talk about the nose. Yeah. You know, you give, smell, me, give me the descriptor. You know, it, for me, it, it smells like, you know, raspberries and rhubarb. And Red a fruit. Cola. Yes, right. A little bit of a smoky tone, which you get from the volcanic soil. Uh, I like the smoky tone. Yeah. It's, it gives I mean, it a it's, little it's, character. It's, and all it's right. classic. Uh, so it's got a full nose. When we poured it in the glass, it filled up the room, which is a nice thing. All right. So first thing, mouthfeel. Just describe to me. Yeah. So mm. similar kind of red fruits on the, on the mouth. No spitting. No spitting. Uh, <laughs> spicy. You but can, give me the mouthfeel. It's sort of a medium body. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a medium light. It's not me, full unctuous. No, medium, not thin. It's medium mouth body. Coating. It's like biting into a crunchy cherry, crunchy raspberry kind of a little bit of cola, some allspice, kind of you know moderate tannins. Uh, so tannins are moderate. Moderate, yeah. Okay, and you were getting into the. The taste descriptors. Yeah, it's you know it's, you can you can taste kind of that licorice and allspice on the on the palate, and you smell the rhubarb, uh, slightly peppery also on the little pepper. Yeah, on on, on the finish, uh, you know, good freshness, good acidity. Um, you know, it's, it's it's moderate. The alcohol is quite moderate, it's only thirteen point one. So great, great. It's, it's pretty you know uh, level. Um, I don't have a chance to ask a lot of people this because we taste wine every week. And at some point, I'll ask you what foods this pairs well with and, you know, if we like the wine. I like the wine, and certainly you're not going to say you don't because I know you picked a good one. But the question is, you set out to make a wine, and is this the representation you hoped for? You know, we had no idea because it's our first vintage, so we didn't really have preconceived notion. We made the wine we know how to make. And, uh, and luckily, the vint vintage was uh, favorable to us, uh, you know, and the grapes came in in great condition. We made the wine in a, the way we know, you know, just mostly whole so bunches. It, and are you happy with the style? You, you couldn't be happier. You yeah. couldn't be. I, okay. you know, it's our first vintage from a place we've never made wine before. So right. from a very herald heralded and famous vineyard. So mm -hmm. it was definitely something which... Uh, it's all first time, so it's... Uh, so this is the 2014 Evening Land La Source. La Source is the particular bottle. It's from the Seven Springs Estate. Um, so let's talk about your wines and, you know, how we can get them. First on this wine, what's the availability? Uh, yeah, you know, you can probably... We just released it now, so... Previous to this, the wine was only available through a mailing list. Okay. Uh, so it's... Uh, and now it's at it, restaurants? Yeah, so now it's going to be in restaurants. Some and, retail? Yes, absolutely. Some okay. retail shows for sure. So, so it's, it's it, because it's not, you know, how many cases did you make? I mean, Oh, this is around 800 cases. Right. So it's, it's a fairly sought after wine. It's a limited production. It's not going to be everywhere, but it is available retail. Um, you will see it at better restaurants. And give me a retail price range. What are we drinking at? Uh, this is 70 Okay. Yeah. And, you know, with Raj, you're going to get 
um, you know, the best wines at a fair price. And this, you know, will compete with any Burgundy. Um, so let's talk about, before we wrap up, how to get your wines. Yeah. What's, so, do we go vineyard by vineyard, sandy.com? Yeah, mean, it's this. Let's, it's, let's inform so people. The, so the evening land is elvwines.com. Uh, okay. And then Sandy is Sandy. S-A-N-D-H-I. S-A-N-D-H-I wines. Dot com, dot com and then domain de la cote domain uh, d-o-m-a-i-n-e de d-e-l-a cote c-o-t-e um, dot com dot com yeah so each each project is its separate project and winery each has its own website each one is you know very there's a lot of explanation to who's involved yeah. what they're doing there's you know a yeah. wine section for buying what's available at that point Prices and all of that. So if you're interested in any of uh, Raj's wines, Sandy, Domaine de la Cote, Evening Land, even worst case scenario, you Google them and they'll show oh, you. Can just email me. Can always email me. I'm... Or, or Raj. And, and, you know, as somebody who's been drinking wine a long time, yeah. and obviously that's why I'm doing the show, Raj is making, you know, some of the, the best wines out there. So lastly, Raj, what would we pair this with? What's well, you a know, good... Traditional I, I think pairing. I think like game birds work really well, you know, like quail or a squab or you know something which is. All right, so uh, let's say you're or, me or, and you're or, not or, around or, a or, lot or, of game or, birds. Or, or, or you're gonna have give you me. Know, you can have anything. You can have uh, buffalo wings with this. You can have uh, fried chicken with this. You can now have, you talk. You can have a pizza with this. I this mean, goes well with any of that. It'll hold yeah, up it, to fried. It'll be great with a pizza. Yeah, chicken wings. So don't yeah. be afraid to. This yeah. isn't, you know, it doesn't have to be some fancy. No, no, okay. you, can, you can just like, you know, you can <clears throat> barbecue or something. It's, you know, it's it's it's, it's definitely it's, it's a medium body wine, so it's not, you know, but you can have it with anything which is not too heavy. Got it, got it. And it is a delicious wine. And when you describe wines, it may not be the most technical term, but delicious is a damn good, is a good you term. know, compliment and all that. All right, we're gonna wrap up, Raj. If you have a question, wine happening, or event, hit me up at samatthegrapenation.com. That's Sam at the Grape Nation. Follow us on Facebook, The Grape Nation. On Instagram, it's at S Ben Ruby. And on Twitter, it's at Ben Ruby without the S. I want to thank my guest, Rajat Parr, winemaker at Sandy, Domaine Della Code, and Evening Land, Seven Springs, for coming in. Raj is on a fierce schedule. He's in for La Pauli. He's got the three wineries. He's an educator. He told you he's writing a book. So Raj isn't sitting home. So it was a pleasure to have him here. I thank you, Raj, for coming in. Thanks, Sam. Thanks. Great to be here. Thanks to our engineer, Vitor, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Great Nation. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.